straight shift with the car chick the podcast that's all about cars buying selling fixing and driving and sometimes pretty fast if you're the car chick now here's he is Welcome, everyone, to The Straight Shift, the last podcast for the 2018 year. I don't know about you guys, but I can't believe how fast 2018 has gone by. And the exciting part is we are seeing a lot of great 2019 car models out on the market. Now, I saw a lot of these models at the Charlotte International Auto Show back in November, but there were a few models that I really, really wanted to see, I was really excited about but they weren't there. The Charlotte Auto Show is, it's a great show. It's put on by the Greater Charlotte Dealers um, Dealers Association and Jen and her team do a great job. The dealers do a great job of helping contribute cars and people to the show. But the reality is Charlotte is around, I don't know, I think about 20th in the market. So for the manufacturers, with them spending less and less money each year on traditional auto shows, Charlotte sometimes gets left out. That and we also frequently are the same weekend or close to the same weekend as the LA Auto Show. So clearly all the really cool, good new stuff goes there. If you haven't seen my review of the Charlotte Auto Show, go to my YouTube channel, which you can get to at carchick-tv.com. That URL will take you directly to my YouTube channel. It's the easiest way to get there. And you can check out my review. There are some great vehicles that I touched on there, including the brand new 2019 Subaru Ascent three-row SUV. That's fantastic. They also redesigned the Forester for 2019, and I covered that. I really loved that one. And the Acura RDX, which was redesigned for 2019. And that vehicle actually won my pick of the show. If you check that out, you can also see my infamous WTF award and meet this fantastic young man, a 10-year-old boy named Logan, that knows more about cars than most of the manufacturer representatives. I tell you, this kid's amazing. So if you haven't seen that video, definitely check it out. But on this podcast, I wanted to cover some of the 2019 vehicles that I really am excited about, that have been highly anticipated in the market, that I wasn't able to cover in that video. First up is the Audi A6 sedan. Audi has been redesigning their vehicles very aggressively over the last couple of years, and the A6 is a full inside-out redesign. With Audi and a lot of the other German manufacturers, they tend to be very conservative. I mean, they're they're German, so they're naturally more conservative. So they don't tend to do daring redesigns. You're not going to usually see the word bold or radical associated with one of their redesigns. They're a little more predictable. They they know what works and they evolve their styling cues a little more conservatively, but that's not to say that they are boring in any way, shape, or form. They just tend to focus their redesigns more on engine performance and technology, as well as luxury refinement, rather than making really weird new exterior styles. So when you see a new Audi or you see a new Mercedes on the road, you are probably not going to be like, whoa, what the heck was that? You're going to be like, oh, that's the Audi. Is that the new one? It looks a little different. And the A6 is no different. It is a little bit bigger. It's longer, it's wider, it's taller than the old A6. And the styling is a teensy bit more aggressive, but it's not, it's definitely not radical. It's still very, very elegant. The interior is gorgeous. Audi keeps upping the luxury quality and comfort of their interiors, but you know, I kind of expect this in a sedan that starts at $60,000. I expect it to be really, really nice, but it's still, I got it and I was like, whoo, this is really, really pretty. And of course it features all of Audi's new technology and that's that's kind of their shtick within the luxury segment. They are probably the best manufacturer in the luxury segment for technology. And they have their brand new MMI entertainment system, which stands for multimedia interface. It's got a full digital dashboard. It's like you look at the whole dashboard and it's almost like this one big widescreen computer monitor. And 
everything that you ever wanted to know and a lot of stuff that you really didn't want to know and didn't care about they put up there um including a big navigation screen and they have the apple carplay android auto integration it's really great technology so if you're you're kind of a techno nerd and you like to have the latest and greatest technology in your vehicles audi is definitely one to take a look at now, in terms of the engine performance, the new A6, it, they're powered by the same 3.0 liter turbocharged V6 that they put in the A7, which is the fastback style, as well as the larger A8 sedan. All-wheel drive is also standard, and this power plant gives you about 335 horsepower and 369 pound-feet of torque. A lot of people don't understand when they hear those numbers, what does that mean? Most people understand what horsepower means. But torque, they kind of want, what, well, what is really torque? And we kind of jokingly say horsepower is how fast you hit the wall and torque is how much of the wall you take with you. Torque is, I translate torque into oomph. Torque is how much get up and go do you have. Horsepower is going to determine, you know, your top speed and, you know, overall how much the vehicle is going to pull. But torque is really what, when you step on it, when you step on that gas pedal, whether you're from a standstill or you're going 35 miles an hour and now you're going to step on it so you can merge onto the freeway, the torque is going to be the thing that gives you that oomph that pick up that get up and go. So, so a vehicle that has a higher torque number than a horsepower number like this A6 is going to have a lot of oomph. You're going to feel that performance and you are not going to question whether or not you're going to be able to get up to speed on one of those crazy tight on ramps on the freeway. So that's just kind of in a nutshell what realistically horsepower and torque means to the average driver. As I said, all-wheel drive is standard on these but Audi has a new technology on the A6. It gives you a lot better gas mileage because they use what they call their new 48 volt mild hybrid system. It's a mild hybrid system as opposed to a spicy hybrid system. No, seriously, this is a this is an interesting new technology. What it means is that they they leverage some of the hybrid technology where you've got you know an electric battery that does a lot of work um, instead of a gas powered engine, but instead of a full hybrid engine system, this one literally is a, a little partial hybrid system. So what it does is it allows the car to do that start stop engine technology that we have seen across a lot of the manufacturers. Um, GM has been using it quite a bit, and it honestly it drives me absolutely crazy. What it does is they, when you get to a traffic light and you're at a red light, it turns the computer turns off the engine to us, so you're not wasting gas while you're idling, and and that's a really great thing because we waste a lot of our gas while we're sitting there idling at traffic lights, and then when you press the gas pedal, the computer basically wakes up the engine and says, "Oh, we got to go." The thing that irritates me about that is there's a delay in the time that it takes when you step on the gas and the computer says, oh, it's time to go and it restarts the engine. It's a reasonably small delay, but it's still a delay. So if you're sitting there at a traffic light in the left-hand turn lane, say, waiting to turn left across traffic, if you see an opening in traffic and you're like, oh, I can go, you have to give yourself, know that there's gonna be an extra half a second or more for the engine to restart. And, you know, I don't like that. I, I want to, if I'm going to go, if I'm going to zip across traffic there, I need to know that when I put my foot on the gas, the response is going to be instant. Now, keep in mind, my driving style is a little more, shall we say, enthusiastic than the average person. So, you know, if you are a more just normal driver and you're not trying to zip across traffic, if you're a little more patient than I am, that time to restart the engine may not bother you. And Audi's restart is definitely better than GM's, you know, because the Germans engineer these things to within an inch of their lives. But the really cool thing, and that's unique about this um, mild hybrid system that Audi has invented, is that it can actually coast with the engine turned off when you're still going anywhere between 35 and 100 miles an hour. 
it's really crazy. And then while it's doing that, it's recuperating power just like a hybrid system does. And that results in not using as much gas. You actually get about an 18% increase in your fuel economy in the A6 because of this wacky new technology. So you're going to get real numbers around 34 miles per gallon combined which for a mid-sized sedan that makes over 300 horsepower, that's quite impressive. Just for comparison's sake, the, um, the Honda Accord sedan, which was redesigned last year that I totally love, it also gets 34 miles per gallon combined. It uses a, a 2.0 liter turbo four-cylinder to do that, so you're only getting 250 horsepower as opposed to the 335 horsepower in the A6. So in the A6, you're getting the same gas mileage with way more power and torque. So if you like a more powerful, you know, typically German performance sedan, the A6 is going to deliver. Now you guys know that I am a little conservative and definitely skeptical about new technologies. Also in my auto show review video that I did, I talked about the new engine technology that Nissan has put in their Altima. It is a variable compression ratio engine. And I'm not going to try and explain what that means in a podcast. It really makes more sense with the visuals. So just go watch that video and it'll explain what that is. But basically, they make this overly complicated engine design to try and squeeze out a few more miles per gallon in fuel efficiency without sacrificing the horsepower. And that's fantastic on paper. But I do not want to be the guinea pig that tests out that new technology on my drive to work every day because I don't know that it's going to be reliable. And, you know, Nissan, bless their heart, they make a lot of great cars, but they do not necessarily have a history of implementing brand new technology designs without any problems. Really, nobody does. So, you know, the Germans are a little bit more conservative. They test the technology for a while. German over-engineering is you know, one of my favorite phrases, and it's absolutely true, but they are very meticulous about what they do. So I don't anticipate that this new system will have nearly you know, the same number of problems as, you know, say if the American manufacturers come out with some new technology, but it's still something to be wary of if you are looking at, you know, potentially purchasing the new A6. Hopefully it will not have any significant problems, but, you know, if it does, hopefully they will come out when the vehicle is still under warranty. It's definitely something to consider especially if you're looking at long-term reliability, a car that you're going to keep. If you're leasing and you're going to turn it in before the warranty expires, then you know, the risk is less. Your greatest risk is sitting at the dealership while they do work under the warranty. But the new A6 is a sweet, sweet ride, and I would not hesitate to recommend it for one of my clients for whom it meets their perfect car profile. Expect these sedans to start floating over from Germany over the next few weeks. There's a few of them that have already hit dealer lots here at the very end of 2018, but expect a lot more to start arriving that you can test drive in 2019. And as I said, again, prices start at 60 grand. So definitely not for the budget conscious, but if you've got the cash flow, it should be a pretty, pretty sweet ride. One other sedan that I wanted to mention that I also did not get to see at the Charlotte Auto Show is a new Mercedes A-Class sedan. And I call it a new sedan because it's new to the U.S. market. But this subcompact entry-level sedan for Mercedes has been in Europe for 20 years. They just hadn't bothered to bring it to the U.S. And it's going to start in the low 30s. It'll slot underneath the CLA in pricing. But everyone who has had a chance to drive this so far says it is way nicer than the CLA. The CLA has been criticized as not really being a Mercedes. Like even the Mercedes was like, oh, well, that's not a real Mercedes. And yeah, to a certain extent, they're being snooty. But there's also a certain level of refinement that one expects from Mercedes Benz. And the CLA does feel a lot cheaper, a lot more plastic than the C-Class. But, you know, 
that's your entry level price point. But they have made the new A class much more refined, much more evocative of the Mercedes brand, worthy of the Mercedes brand, but still at that starting in the low 30s price point. I say starting in the low 30s because you can add options very quickly and jack it up into the 40s, even close to 50 grand if you really want to. But if you start doing that, then you got to think, okay, you know, should there be another vehicle that I'm considering instead? The only thing that I'm disappointed about is the A-Class in Europe comes in a hatchback, a lot like the Volkswagen Golf, but nicer. And it's one of the hottest hatchbacks in Europe, and I absolutely love it. It's it's a fun car. It's a tuner vehicle. I mean, you can do so much with this little hatchback if you're into you know little performance cars like I am. But no, we're not going to get it. Canada is going to get it, but it's not planning to hit the U.S. market, which is a huge bummer. And I really hope that if the sedan is successful here, that Mercedes will reconsider and they will release the little hot hatch to the U.S. market. I'm going to take a really quick break, folks. And when I come back, we're going to talk about some SUVs that are coming out that I'm really excited about, including the redesigned Toyota RAV4, the Lexus UX, and the Kia Telluride. I'll be right back after this. Do you hate car shopping? Do you worry about being taken advantage of or about finding the right car at a fair price? Buying a car can be a frustrating and time-consuming experience. But what if you could get a great deal without having to do a ton of research, without having to haggle, and without the fear of buying a lemon? You can. As your personal car shopper, the Car Chick will help you pick the perfect car based on your unique lifestyle, budget, and personality. She'll handle all of the legwork and negotiating for you. All you have to do is sign the papers and take the keys. It's that easy. To learn how the car chick can save you time, money, and hassle on your next car purchase, give us a call at 888-575-2138. That's 888-575-2138. Or visit us on the web at thecarchick.com. Ah, the car chick is back for more straight shift. Welcome back to The Straight Shift. We are talking about some of the most anticipated new and redesigned vehicles for 2019. And the one that I am the most excited about, I went to the auto show in November, super stoked to see this vehicle, and it wasn't there. And it's a 2019 Toyota RAV4. Okay, you may be thinking, why were you so excited to see a Toyota RAV4? Well, here's why. The RAV4, while you know being economical and it's never been sexy, and you know I like seeing sexy things and sporty things, but the RAV4 has been historically the single most reliable, dependable, small SUV on the market. You can never go wrong with a Toyota RAV4. And I can't say that about any other small SUV, not even the Honda CRV, because there have been years with, where the CRV has had problems, including recently with their silly oil gas mixture problem that they've had on a few of their vehicles. We'll talk about that on a different day. But the RAV4 is just a no brainer choice when you're looking for a small. SUV and one of your priorities is reliability. If you keep vehicles for a long time and put a lot of miles on them, you need to look at the RAV4 no matter what model year it is. But I was super excited to see the 2019 redesign because the styling of the RAV over the years has been kind of meh. It's gone from meh to a little funky to, you know, it's it just doesn't appeal to everyone. It has never been what I would consider, you know, rugged. I wouldn't think that the RAV4 is something that you would take off-road to go camping. Well, now it is. The new design is just amazing. And Toyota teased me with this new design at the auto show by having a giant billboard with pictures of the 2019 RAV4 but they didn't have the actual vehicle there. They had the 2018 model there. I'm like, guys, really? You might as well just not even bring it at all if you're going to tease me like that. But the new ones are going to start hitting dealer lots 
in January, I've just got probably another couple weeks before I can get my hands on one of these and actually do a full test of it. And I am planning to do that. I'm going to do a full review and actually compare it side by side to the Honda CRV. Now, the, the RAV4, as I said, it's been so reliable, but it hasn't been perfect. Rear visibility has been so so, especially in the last model where it was kind of very angular style. All the SUVs, when they got funky and angular, started losing their rear and three quarter visibility, which is really important. So, even with a backup camera, you know, that's great if you're backing up, but even when you're driving forward, you still need to be able to see as much as you can 360 degrees around the vehicle. And, and the RAV4's rear visibility was definitely not the best in the market. But now they have redesigned it so that it is a little more boxy. They've kind of gone back to the you know squarish styling, um, at least of the cockpit, so that when you look in your rear view mirror, you can actually see you don't have funky angles. You have a little more you know squares and rectangles, which are easier to see out of. The other kind of drawbacks to the RAV4 over the years have been the interior styling has felt very plasticky, um, which is because it's actually made out of plastics, but they have redone that now. The interior is way better. It is still plasticky, but they are using higher quality plastics. And that is really true across the board. Even a lot of the luxury manufacturers are still using a lot of plastics because they're cheaper and they're lighter. So you got to do what you got to do to meet the cafe standards and to keep your vehicle costs down. But there's like Walmart level plastics and then there's, you know, higher level Nordstrom type plastics. And they're using much higher quality plastics now, even in things like Hondas and Toyotas and Subarus. And with the RAV, they've combined the, the plastics with a lot of nice soft touch um, materials and some funky accents. And they blended it all together so that the interior styling is much, much nicer now. It is not on the level of a Mazda CX-5. If the interior quality is extremely important to you, but you can't afford a Mercedes or a Lexus, you definitely want to look at the Mazda CX-5. The interiors on the Mazdas are absolutely luxury level quality, but with a normal vehicle price tag. But the interior of the RAV4 is nice. It's way better. It's functional. It's ergonomic. And with the adventure trim level, it's a little bit fun. It has some like literally bright orange accents, very, very similar to the redesigned Subaru Forester, which you can see in my auto show video. So you can see kind of what I'm talking about with the, the type of the interior and the little orange accents if you don't wait, want to wait for the re video review that I will do of the RAV4. Actually, the, it's interesting, the new 2019 redesigned RAV4 and the new redesigned 2019 Subaru Forester are a lot alike in many, many ways, styling wise. I don't know if the designers were in cahoots with each other or if they were both smoking the same stuff when they did the designs, but there's a lot of similar feel to both vehicles and I'm excited equally about both of them. One of the other shortcomings of the Toyota RAV4 and all Toyotas has been the lack of the Apple CarPlay Android Auto smartphone integration technology. Lots of other vehicles have been implementing that. And what I have found in 2018, that was one of the most requested options by my clients. They really, really wanted that full smartphone integration that you only get with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Some of the other manufacturers have kind of a, a semi interface that gets sort of some of your cell phone technology integrated with the car, but not the full integration. And as a result, Toyota has lost a little bit of market share to that. For me, you know, I buy a lot of Toyotas every year, but I looked at my data and for 2018, I have bought a lot of fewer Toyotas this year than I have in previous years. And it is exactly directly attributable to the lack of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Now, you might want to know why Toyota has not gotten on this bandwagon. They have instead relied on their own proprietary interface system and this Scout GPS system that they developed, and it kind of sucks. So why did, why did Toyota do that? It's not what you may think. It is not a technology problem. 
it is not a, you know, Toyota thinking they could do it better on their own problem. It's actually due to privacy and security. So strap in for the next couple minutes because I'm going to tell you some things about how the Apple CarPlay Android Auto systems work and what they do behind the scenes to spy on you that's probably going to make you feel a little bit nauseous. Apple CarPlay is not nearly as bad, but Toyota was still, they, they do a couple things. They're a very conservative company. That's something that tends to be indicative of the Japanese Nissan notwithstanding. But what Toyota does is they they never just jump on a new technology bandwagon and implement it in order to be the first to market. They let other companies do that. You know, they let Ford do that. You know, they let Nissan do that. They let the Germans even do that. They sit back and watch and they let everybody else make the mistakes and have the problems and do all the recalls and work out the kinks. And then once the technology is proven, then and only then does Toyota take it, make it even better, and then implement it. This is why Toyota is extremely reliable and also why their vehicles sometimes are behind the market in technology um, and even styling redesigns because they only do something if they know they can do it right. And I respect that even when it sometimes frustrates me that their vehicles are very dated in comparison to their competitors. But what Toyota did when they were looking at the smartphone integration from Apple CarPlay and Android Auto was they they didn't feel comfortable turning over full control of that smartphone integration to a third party both for a reliability standpoint, because now, okay, this is a technology that is not under their own internal quality control systems. They are relying on Apple and Google to prove out the technology and make it work and just kind of trust that they can integrate it. And there have been issues in other systems. Um, for example, the new Acura RDX, which was my pick of the show this year, they implemented it, but the Android Auto portion doesn't work because of a technical glitch between the RDX's touchpad interface system and the Android operating system. Acura says it's on Google's end and Google is working through it. And as soon as they have a fix, they'll do a software update and everybody's will work. But again, they're relying on this third party system to make things work. But where Toyota really had a problem was on the privacy and security side. Back in 2015, Motor Trend released a report that alleged that Google was collecting a boatload of data when the Android Auto system was activated in their cars. Data that they didn't feel Google had any business it taking. They didn't need any of this information. And, and when I say that data, here's what I'm talking about. What speed your vehicle is going? What are your engine revs? What's the throttle position? What are your coolant and oil temps? Basically, they were taking a full ODB2 data dump out of your car. The ODB, uh, OBD2, I always get that backwards. OBD2 system is the computer system in your car. That's when you, know, you go to the mechanic and your check engine lights on. They plug in a scan tool, a computer to a data port in your car. It's under the dash usually. And they use their scan tool to talk to your car's computer and find out what, what codes it's throwing, what's wrong. It's the interface to your car's computer brain. And that system does process and collect a boatload of data for diagnostic purposes. But Google was allegedly pulling all that data and doing what with it exactly? Well, Google claimed that they were collecting that data so they could provide a more accurate navigation experience. Do I buy that? Mm, not really only to a certain extent. Apple CarPlay, on the other hand, Apple only cares to know if the car is moving while you're using their system. That seems fairly reasonable. They don't collect all of that other data. But Apple is not the same kind of company that Google is. You know, Apple is a computer device company. 
Google is way more than that. And, you know, if you do any stuff with Google Analytics on your own websites, you know that Google is all about collecting data and literally trying to know absolutely everything there is to know about you, your life, your family, your spending habits, what you do. They want to spy on you and know absolutely everything that you do. So I am really, it's bad enough that that happens when I'm online and I'm shopping around and, you know, I'm looking at something on Amazon and then next thing I know I'm on a totally separate website, but there's an ad for that thing on Amazon because they've been cyber stalking me and my behaviors. I expect that when I'm on the internet. I do not expect Google to be spying on me while I am in my car. I mean, if you think about it, if they're pulling that kind of data, like your vehicle speed and your engine revs and things that really are indicative of your driving behavior, what the heck are they doing with that? Is that information that they're selling to someone else that they could give the government access to? I mean, what if the government could just access that data directly from your car, which by the way, they want to anyway, because they would rather charge you taxes based on the miles that you drive every year and how you drive instead of putting that tax on gasoline because that's what goes into the government's infrastructure budget and again that's a whole other topic that we can talk about on another podcast but the government wants that data from your car anyway what if they get access to it and use the data about the speed you were going, and they can just mail you a speeding ticket and say, hey, according to your car's data on this date and time, you were going 15 miles over the speed limit. Here's your ticket. Thank you very much. Can you imagine? I would be totally screwed. (laughs) I don't want anybody collecting that data from my vehicle, and there's no way to opt out of that right now. So this is the core of Toyota's issue with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So that being said, they have to balance the ability to go to market and be competitive with their competitors because most people don't know that there even is a privacy and data issue with these systems. So, you know, they just, hey, I want my smartphone integration with the car because it's super duper convenient. So they don't think about the fact that somebody could be totally spying on you through that system. So Toyota has to still be competitive in the market. So they have implemented Apple CarPlay because they are now comfortable that Apple's not collecting a whole bunch of data that they don't think they should have, but they are not implementing Android Auto. So if you do look at a 2019 RAV4 or like the new redesigned Avalon, any of the new redesigned Toyotas that are coming out from here on out are going to have Apple CarPlay. But until Toyota can feel comfortable with Google and what they're doing with your data, which doesn't look like it's going to come to you know an agreement anytime soon, Android users are not going to have that functionality in their car. And quite honestly, now that I have dug into this a little bit more and really seen what Google is taking in terms of information and then being very cagey about what they're doing with it, I'm not sure I want that technology in my car. I, you know, I have a lot to lose if people start spying on my driving behaviors. So I would just as soon keep my own privacy and not have that level of integration. So that is just one of the things that that's why Toyota does what they do. And, you know, a representative from Toyota has specifically said that until, you know, this feature or any other features, you know, we're not going to implement that despite the demand until they have confidence that consumer privacy and data security have been addressed to Toyota's high standards. So thank you, Toyota, for watching out for us. And especially knowing that and the fact that, you know, at least you're going to hit the Apple customers, I am never going to hesitate to recommend a Toyota RAV4. And it also has some more mechanical goodies as well. Um, You're going to have two choices of powertrains. Both of them have a 2.5 liter inline four engine. The regular one is mated to an eight speed automatic transmission. That sounds boring, but it actually makes seven more horsepower than the previous version. So you're going to get 203 horsepower, 184 foot pounds of torque. That engine is still a little bit buzzy. It's not as quiet, especially under acceleration as I would like it to be. But if that's not a priority for you, it's not a big deal. It's still really reliable and you're still going to get a seven mile per gallon increase in gas mileage. So you're going to be around 32 miles per hour combined, which for a small SUV, 
is pretty darn good. If that's not quite good enough for you, they also have a hybrid powertrain option. Again, the same 2.5 liter inline four motor, but it's paired to an electronically controlled continuously variable transmission. It gives you four different hybrid modes and gets about 41 miles per gallon in the city, 37 on the highway. And the hybrid model is only going to be about $2,000 more than its regular counterpart. Expect prices to start at about $26,000 for your base LE model and go up to about $34,000 for the top of the line limited model. And you can get a couple of really interesting all wheel drive options. Front wheel drive obviously is standard, except on the hybrid. Hybrids are always all wheel drive, but they do have a new um, all wheel drive system that they call dynamic torque vectoring all wheel drive with rear drive line disconnect. What the heck does that mean? It means that the system can direct up to 50% of the torque, and I remember I told you torque was oomph, get up and go, to the rear wheels, and then distribute it between the left and right wheels depending on where it's needed. This is going to help you get unstuck in mud, snow, on ice. Basically, it puts the power to whichever wheel it needs to, to get you out of the challenging situation that you managed to get yourself into. So the RAV4 is going to be very capable of taking you off-road, going camping just as well as going to the grocery store, picking up your kids. It's an all-around fantastic small SUV, and I am really looking forward to getting my hands on a demo model that I can test out, hopefully for a few days, and then give you a more detailed video of review. They should start hitting dealer lots this January with the hybrid models to follow, probably around late March. Just a couple other SUV mentions. Lexus is coming out with a new micro SUV called the UX. It's on the same platform as the funky little Toyota CHR. There will be regular and hybrid versions, and they are already starting to hit dealer lots, and you can expect prices to kind of be in the mid-30s to low 40s. And the other one I am excited about is the new Kia Telluride. It's a brand new boxy three-row, eight-passenger SUV. It's larger. It's more rugged than kind of the grocery hauling, boring Sorento. And I got to play in one of these at SEMA um, earlier this fall. And um, I'm going to go post like right now a video to my YouTube channel um, showing the ride. They didn't let me drive it on this off-road course. I had to settle for being a passenger. But um, it was really still very cool to, to take it on this off-road course. And my favorite part is they have not only a 360 around the car camera system, but there's even a camera underneath the car so that you can see whatever it was that you just backed over. So if you back over some toy your kid left in the driveway, you can at least look under the car on this camera and go, oh, that's what I ran over. It's technically designed for when you're off-roading to monitor the, the rugged terrain underneath the car because what happens to people that go off-roading is they think they can clear something because the four tires are going over the rocks, but in the middle, there's this big jagged rock that sticks up and they run over that and, you know, and they tear up the underside of their car. So that's what that camera is technically for. I personally think it's going to be used a lot more for looking at what you just ran over in your driveway. Anyway, the new Telluride, it was designed at Kia's U.S. design studio, and it's currently in production at their Georgia plant. So it's made in the United States, and it should be released in Q1 of 2019, but as a 2020 model. They haven't announced pricing yet, but I'm expecting it to start in the 40s for a decently trimmed out model. Well, thanks so much for listening to all these vehicles that I'm really excited about for 2019. Again, if you haven't seen my auto show review video that covered the new Subaru Ascent, the Forester, the Acura RDX, the little Hyundai Kona, um, the Nissan Altima, several other new and redesigned 2019 vehicles, be sure to check that out on my YouTube channel at carchick-tv.com. You can also watch them on my blog, on my regular website at thecarchick.com. And while you're there, check out some of my other fun videos like the snarky series of Shut Up and Drive and some videos about how to avoid being taken advantage of by extended warranty scams. 
folks, take care. And if you're confused by all these vehicles out there and you'd like my help, while you're on my website, just fill out the contact form. Give me a call. Let's schedule a time to sit down and talk to find out what the perfect vehicle for you is going to be, whether it's a 2019 model or something else. Have a safe and happy new year, everyone. Drive safely. I'm out of here. The Straight Shift Podcast is copyright Leanne Shattuck, The Car Chick, 2017. All views expressed by guest and or co-hosts are those of the guest and or co-hosts, and not necessarily those of Leanne Shattuck or the car chair. Mm-hmm.